Hello, my name is Tommy and in this video I'm going to talk about how I used mathematical optimization to find the best Pokemon party. This is a video for those of you who like Pokemon, but it's also a video for people who might be interested in learning a little bit about mathematical optimization. If you prefer reading over watching a video, please go to my website and have a look at the write-up that I did there. You'll be able to see the figures and zoom in and review things in a bit more detail on that link. Let's get started. <clears throat> We're going to split this presentation in three parts. We're going to talk about modeling, define what we mean by a good party. We're going to talk about computation. How do we find the best party efficiently, given that we have a model and a problem that we want to solve? This is not a trivial thing because if you look at the number of combinations, you have 151 Pokemon and you want to select five, there are almost 15 billion possible parties. And checking every possible party would take around five days on my computer, so we want to be a bit smarter. We're going to get that time down to half a second. Finally, we want to do some inspection and evaluate how each member of the party contributes to the overall success of the parties. To do that, we're going to use Shapley values, which is an idea from game theory. And this party that you see before you from, from the first generation of games is the optimal party. But of course, me telling you that is not very interesting. Um, I'm going to justify it, and hopefully you'll agree that it's a good model and that this party is indeed very good. More formally, we're going to do the modeling by defining a function f, mapping from a party to a real number. So if you give me two parties, I'll be able to apply f, and and whichever party gives, gives me the highest score is the better party of the two. And this way we have a method for comparing parties. Then we're going to find the argument that maximizes f, the domain is huge, as I told you, so we're going, going to have to be smart about it. And finally, inspection, which I talked about already. We're going to look at how each individual Pokemon in the party influenced this um, value. Let's get started by talking about modeling. So what makes a, a Pokemon good? Well, a Pokemon has types. For instance, Bulbasaur here is of type Grass and Poison. And a Pokemon has some base stats, and the most um, interesting thing might be the total stats, which is 318 for Bulbasaur. We could just look at the uh, total stats, get uh, six Pokemon with the highest stats, and claim that this is the best party. Certainly not a bad party, each of these Pokemon are on an individual level really good, but they don't complement each other nicely and they don't use any type information. And type information is really important. So if you look at Bulbasaur for instance, some types of attacks are way more effective than others against them. So a fire attack uh, gets a multiplier of 2, meaning it will de deal twice the damage. Grass attack is not very effective against both grass and poison, which are the types uh, that Bulbasaur has. So a grass attack will actually only deal one fourth of the damage on Bulbasaur. That's a really weak attack against Bulbasaur. There's the concept of a type chart, a matrix telling you the multipliers that are applied when you use an attack of a certain type on a Pokemon with a certain type, and if the Pokemon has two types, you multiply these factors together. So let's look at this on, on a particular set of Pokemon. So what if Golem meets Bulbasaur in battle, and Golem is attacking Bulbasaur? We're going to do a simplification here, and this is uh, important because we are going to deviate a little bit from from the real world as presented by the games and simplify a little bit by saying that a Pokemon only has access to moves of the same type as its own type. 
So Golem here is of type rock and ground, and we're going to assume that he only has access to rock and ground type moves. We're going to assume that he has access to both, but nothing uh, apart from rock and ground. So no normal attacks or anything like that. If he uses a ground attack, the multiplier is 0 0.5 against grass and 2 against poison. But these have to be multiplied together, so the, 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 the factor is 1. If he uses a rock attack, on the other hand, both the factors are 1. These are multiplied together, and it's still 1. So he has, he doesn't have a particularly good attack advantage, but not a bad one either. It's a standard multiplier, 1. What if we turn the tables and let Bulbasaur attack Golem? Well, if he uses a grass type move, um, the total multiplier is 4, and if he uses a poison type move, the total multiplier is 1 fourth. Of course, Bulbasaur is going to do what's in his best interest and use a grass type move. So the attack advantage of Bulbasaur when he meets Golem is 4. If we look at both of these factors and divide them, we'll get the edge or the overall advantage in this match. So the edge of Golem against Bulbasaur is one fourth, or equivalently, if you if you turn the tables, the attack advantage of Bulbasaur against Golem is four. This means that Bulbasaur is very likely to win this match. Now we're going to study, study a very simplified problem. We're just going to look at the nine starter Pokemon and we'll assume that all the Pokemon that are available in the universe is nine Pokemon and look at the overall advantage or the edge when these Pokemon meet each other. And you see there's this um, structure in the matrix. It's kind of like a rock, paper, scissors type thing where fire is good against grass, grass is good against water, and water is good against fire. Now, we can make this really important observation, which is that some Pokémon dominate others, meaning that they are... Um, that there's, there are some Pokémon which are worse in, in every respect. And I've included a, a final column showing the total stats of the Pokemon because if all the edges, all the overall advantages against other Pokemon are equal, then you, you want to choose the Pokemon with the highest total stats. So look at, for instance, Bulbasaur and Ivysaur. They're of the same type, so their, um, their edge against all other, other Pokemon is identical. but. Ivysaur has, a, has higher total stats in, in row 2. So there's really no reason to ever pick Bulbasaur over Ivysaur here, right? Bulbasaur is not better in anything. It's actually worse in, in uh, total stats. So we can get rid of Bulbasaur completely. And the same logic applies to Ivysaur and Venusaur, where Venusaur dominates Ivysaur. If we remove all Pokemon which are dominated by others, we're just left with three Pokemon here. Venusaur, Charizard, and Blastoise. And we want to figure out if we had this party of three, how good is this party? And of course, what we'll do when we meet um, an opponent, which is represented by a column, is we'll switch to the best Pokemon. So if, if we meet a water Pokemon, we'll switch to grass and so forth. So we take the maximum over each row to produce this final row. And we'll use the geometric average of the bottom row to determine how good this party is. And this is the average edge or the total score of the party. Here it's 2.94. And this means that on average, if we switch to the Pokemon which has the best edge against our opponent, will have a factor of almost three for our attacks or they will have a disadvantage correspondingly. The reason we use a geometric average is because um, there's a symmetry around one here. Like two is as good as a half is bad. And this is maintained or this property is kind of uh, kept if we use the geometric average instead of the 
arithmetic average. So let's look at the best party by stats, which I showed earlier, and we do the exact same thing. We list all of the 151 Pokemon as different columns. And we compute this um, new row on the bottom showing the best edge, taking the maximum over the six top rows. And we see that the average edge here is 1.95. It's decent, but it's not that good. I claim that this is the best party. So you'll see that in some cases, uh, individually, a Pokemon might not be that good, but these Pokemon complement each other really nicely. No matter what uh, opponent this party meets, you can always switch to a really good Pokemon and take it out easily. And the average edge here is almost 5, which means you get on average a multiplier of 5, or they, they get... Um, uh, um, when they attack you, their attacks are not effective. So this is a huge advantage when you meet other Pokemon. So to summarize, if we just looked at total stats, the top party has an average edge of uh, 1.95, but the bottom party has an average edge of 4.99, which is way higher. And the way we evaluate a party is we construct this matrix of every edge, every pair of Pokemon, 105 times 105, what, one, 151, sorry, 151 times 151 matrix. We pick six rows, six Pokemon, we compute the maximum over these rows to produce a new row, and then we compute the geometric average over these maximums, and that's the score. Here are the equations for this optimization problem. And you can pause here and you can look at it if you want to, but um, I'm going to just go ahead. Okay, so we have a function, we have a way to evaluate a party and now we want to find the best party. There are many approaches to this problem. Uh, some heuristics might be to sample random combinations and just evaluate them and keep the best one. This doesn't have any guarantee at all. It's a good way to start because you get an idea of the problem and which parties are good and which parties are bad. But it's not really how you want to solve it in practice. You could use a greedy algorithm. Um, this is very similar to a known problem called the maximum coverage problem. You could use simulated annealing or taboo search. Or it's also ways to get an exact solution. You can formulate this as a mixed integer program, or you can implement the Brandon Bounds algorithm. And we're going to talk about two of these. Um, one is the greedy algorithm, and the other one is the branch and bound algorithm. But uh, no matter what you do, you should always remove these dominated Pokemon or Pareto dominated Pokemon first. So out of 151 Pokemon, it turns out that only 30 are worth considering because all other are dominated. They are of the same type and their total stats is lower. So there's no reason to ever consider the, the remaining 121 Pokemon. And this greatly reduces the search space from almost 15 billion um, parties to 600,000 parties. So no matter how you solve it, that's a really important um, thing to realize and to implement before you do anything else. Let's look at the greedy algorithm. It's uh, very simple. It produces this party. You start with an empty party and while your party doesn't have six Pokemon, you go through every candidate. You temporarily add it to your party. Um, you evaluate this party and then you select whichever Pokemon um, um, was the best one. And the complexity is low as well. In the first iteration, you have to consider every 151 Pokemon. In the second one, you have chosen ones. So you have to consider 150 Pokemon. And this amounts to around 900 evaluations, which is nothing. And it's instantaneous, basically. So this is not a problem, but it's not the optimal party. So let's talk about how we can find the optimal party and guarantee optimality, because that's what it really means to solve a, an optimization problem. 
First, I have to show you an algorithm for generating combinations. Uh, and now I just mean combinations in the mathematical sense, like you want to choose a subset of a certain, or find every subset of a certain length where the order of the elements doesn't matter. So to do this, you implement a recursive function. You keep two lists on each node and you do a tree search. The first list is um, a list of chosen Pokemon. And on the root node, this will be empty. The second list is the remaining Pokemon or just in general, the remaining elements. And then you, um, you create children where you add elements from the remaining to the chosen. So in this first child, you add A over to chosen. Second one, you add B and you add C and you add D and you actually remove the ones, the elements before the one that you moved over. So here you, re you remove A and here you remove A and B and so forth. And the reason why you do that is because you don't want to end up with both, for instance, A, B and A, C, because the order doesn't matter. And then you, you continue doing this until you get uh, the chosen list, um, a chosen list with two elements and then you're done. So you, you can work this out by hand if you have four elements and you want to find every combination of two elements, they are exactly A, B, A, C, A, D, B, C, and, and B, D. So simple enough. Now I have to introduce you to branch and bound. And you can, if you don't like my explanation, you can go to Wikipedia and look this up a bit more. The idea is pretty simple. You have to have a, a way of establishing a lower bound and an upper bound on each node or every partial solution. So this root node here would be an empty party and the numbers are just fictitious, but assume the lower bound is zero and the upper bound is nine. And then you branch, so you create children, you get A1, A2 and A3 and they all have lower bounds and upper bounds. And the best objective, you, you keep track of the the maximum lower bound that you've seen. That's that's the best objective. And you know you can do at least that good, right? So here, A1 has a lower bound of three. So you know that you can, if you expand A1, you're, you can get three or higher. And you guide the search by, for instance, the lower bound, um, that's called the best first search. Um, Instead of doing breadth first or depth first, you want to guide it by some heuristic. You could, for instance, use the lower bound. That's what we'll do here. So we'll expand A1. Expanding A1, you get B1, B2, and B3. And you get some lower bounds and upper bounds for these children. Now the best objective we've seen so far, the maximum lower bound is five and that's seen in B3. So B3 is the next node that we would expand. But now we can make a really interesting observation, um, which is that we can remove some nodes. Because we have also been keeping track of upper bounds. And the best objective is five. So if the upper bound here is three, and you know you can't do better than three if you expand this node and go down further, but you already have five, then there's no reason to consider this uh, node A3 anymore. So you can prune this away from the search. Likewise with A2, the upper bound is four and the best objective is five. So you, you already know that you can do better than this upper bound, so there's no reason to expand and the same logic applies to B two. So that's how branch and bound works. Now let's look at a, a real world example. I have yet to explain how to compute lower bounds and upper bounds for the Pokemon problem, but we'll get to that first. Let's look at an example of what this graph might look like. Let's simplify things and assume that we want to pick the best party of three Pokemon from the first 25 Pokemon. We start with a root node. This is just an empty party and we branch. You might say, why are there so few 
children nodes here because we have 25 Pokemon. But remember, we removed every Pokemon that was dominated by uh, another Pokemon. So we actually end up with nine children instead of 25. And this green node is uh, on the right is the next one to be expanded. We expand and immediately we see some red nodes. These are pruned away. They have uh, upper bounds that are lower than the, um, the best lower bound that we've seen so far. So there's no reason to consider these red nodes at all. Keep going. And we keep going. And here we find a party. So we are now from the root node, which had zero Pokemon. We added one Pokemon, two Pokemon, three Pokemon. We examined this node and we found the best party so far, but we're not finished because there are many blue nodes and these need to be examined. So we keep going. And on iteration 16, it looks like this. What's going to happen now is we're going to find a better party, which is this green one, the bottom left green one over here. So going from iteration 16 to 17, we find the best party. And this is actually the best party that we will find in this um, graph search. But we have to keep going because we have some blue nodes and we haven't established that these cannot possibly have the best solution. So we, we have to check these out as well. And that's what the algorithm spends time doing until iteration 39. And now it's proven or it's checked every node and it, it, it can guarantee you that this is actually the best solution. So it actually found the solution in 17 iterations, but it had to keep going till 39 to prove that it was actually the optimal solution. Let's talk about some practical tricks, some implementation details. So some things that I did were I immediately computed a greedy solution to establish a strong lower bound before I did anything when I implemented this. Recall that each node contains two lists, one list with chosen Pokemon, the current party, and one list with remaining Pokemon. So an obvious lower bound is just to evaluate the chosen Pokemon. So if you have four, they, you can evaluate a party of four. You want to get to six and obviously that's going to be a lower bound because adding something will will never decrease the value. A, a, a tighter lower bound, which is a bit more computationally expensive, is to do a greedy algorithm on the remaining Pokemon. So you fix the chosen ones and you run the greedy algorithm on the remaining ones. The upper bound that I used is I just evaluated the chosen and the remaining Pokemon. The, union of these two lists or these two sets and it should be obvious that that's an upper bound it's like removing the constraint that you have to choose six and instead you say i want to choose everything and obviously that's an upper bound for this problem another trick that really made a difference is to sort the children by lower bound and what you want to do is you want to start with the one which has the highest lower bound because then you can prune away the other ones, the other children in that um, in that branching. So you want to establish good lower bounds as quickly as possible. So that really helps as well. So let's count how many nodes we explore. Um, and my definition of explore here is pop off the priority queue before proving optimality on the real real problem where you have to choose six out of 151 Pokemon. If I just do like a simple implementation with almost none of these tricks, I of course use upper and lower bounds, but I don't use tight bounds. I don't sort the nodes. Um, when I exp before I expand them, I explore 9,000 nodes. If I implement some tricks, I explored 521 nodes. If I implemented every trick and I I tweak it and look at uh, what achieves the best performance. I actually only ended up exploring 373 nodes. So <laughs> you have to appreciate that this is not a lot of nodes compared to the 15 billion <laughs> that you, 15 billion that you would have to explore if you if you did this the naive way. 
so I'm very happy with this obviously and it should be noted that there's a danger of overfitting your data set if you tweak the algorithm too much but I suspect this would do well on similar instances let's talk about timing I already said that if I were to check every party it would take five days if I do branch and bound, but I don't remove the dominated Pokemon, that would take eight minutes. If I remove the um, dominated Pokemon and then I check every party naively instead of using branch and bound, it would take 18 seconds. But if I both remove Pareto dominated Pokemon and I use branch and bound, it takes around half a second to get an optimal solution. Okay, let's talk about inspection and Shapley values. So the total value for this party is 4.99 and each Pokemon has an individual value. Uh, but this is a non-additive function because it's the interplay between these Pokemon that makes it such a good party. So who contributes what to this party? That seems like a pretty natural question to ask. Like, if there was a money price and and <laughs> these Pokemon said, well, we don't want to share this money equally. We, we want to get rewarded for our contribution. How would you split that money um, uh, to each Pokemon? So one idea is to take the to, to score the party and then subtract the score of the party without Pokemon I and then that's the that's the contribution of Pokemon I. It's like the marginal contribution. You, you remove it and then you add it and you say, well, how, how much did the overall score improve when I added this Pokemon? That's a good idea, but there's a, an extension of this idea called the Shapley value. What it, what it does is it looks at every single subset that doesn't have Pokemon I, and then it adds Pokemon I, and it says, what what's that? difference what's that marginal difference and it weights every subset by how um, how common that subset is and this is the Shapley value it has a lot of nice properties you can go on Wikipedia it was uh, established by Lloyd Shapley in the 50s and he actually won the Nobel Prize in Economics in two 2012 for this idea um, so it's pretty simple idea um, from game theory uh, but but it has really nice properties one of which is the fact that if you if you add all the Shapley values together you get the, the total value of the party or the coalition as it's called in game theory so if you wanted to split the money price on these Pokemon the first one um, uh, w would uh, have a claim to 1.2 over 4.99 of the money using the Shapley value as, as a guide. Now let's look at some results. Um, the best party found in the red-blue games. Um, I have added a constraint that the, each Pokemon must be able to uh, be found in the game. So I've excluded legendary Pokemon such as Mew and Mewtwo. This is the best party. Uh, to the right of the table below you see the um, score of each individual Pokemon and in the square brackets you see the Shapley value of uh, each Pokemon in the party. Let's run the same analysis for the next generation of games, Gold Silver. This is the best party found. Here there are more Pokemon in the game so the table is <laughs> even smaller and even wider. If you want a high resolution picture and study it more closely then you can go to my website the, I'll provide a link and you can go look at the figures and zoom in as far as you like there you might be interested in the worst party this is the worst party in, in gold silver as you can see each Pokemon is really bad by itself and they are very similar so they don't really play on each other's strengths at all so it's, it's bad because each, each Pokemon is individually bad and they're also very similar. So that's like the worst thing you can do under this model. Finally, the best party found in the third generation, Ruby Sapphire, is this party. 
it has an average edge of 5.48 which is a huge value and you can see that no matter what what pokemon this party meets you can switch to a pokemon which has a huge advantage you could extend the the entire analysis to include moves to do this you would add several copies of each pokemon and, and look at every combination of moves that it could have and kind of extend the ideas that i've presented here i'm not going to pursue this because i think it's tough to say if this is useful in a sense because like some of these moves such as double edge actually inflicts damage back on the user that's and, and as such it might not be a good move to use in practice that's really hard for a model to capture which is partly why i made the assumption that the the type of moves that a pokemon has corresponds to the type of the pokemon itself but this is what the model gives you if you run it uh, including uh, moves for each pokemon in summary then my model says that the best party is the party that maximizes type advantage against all other Pokemon. Other modeling choices and refinements are of course possible, it's just a model. When it comes to computation, removing the Pareto dominated Pokemon is really important, vastly reduces the search space and actually makes it possible to just do a naive algorithm. But if you really want speed, you have to use branch and bound which is simple to implement. It's, um, it's an idea from, from the 1960s. I think it was published in 1960. Very simple, very powerful, and very good in practice. And for inspection, I introduced the Shapley value, um, which I believe was invented in the 50s by Lloyd Shapley. And it tells you how much each Pokemon contributes individually to the party because the function or the, the sum, it's, it's not additive. So then the Shapley value can really take it apart. It's also used in machine learning to tell you which, uh, which features contribute to a prediction. So that's a popular use case of the Shapley value in, in our times, but it's really from game theory and it can be used to to solve um, game theoretic problems where you have coalitions or problems like this. I hope you, you thought this was cool and I hope you liked uh, hearing about it as much as I did creating this presentation and my write-up. If you want more information, please check out the website. Thank you so much.